Mr. President, I first want to make a simple declarative sentence. There is no one in this body who is for open borders. One of the most troublesome aspects of this debate, as it has been framed particularly by the administration, is that you're either for the wall or open borders. That is not true. Virtually every member, well, two-thirds of us voted in 2013 for a very strong border security provision as part of the Comprehensive Immigration Reform Bill that passed this body, as I say, by two-thirds. It was never taken up in the House. Had it been taken up in the House, it likely would have passed, the President would have signed it, and a lot of these issues would be behind us. All of us, everyone here on both sides of the aisle, support border security. What we support is cost-effective, effective, sensible border security, not border security that really doesn't fit the nature of the problem that we face, and so far, anyway, is undefined in terms of location, design, cost, and all the other characteristics of any major construction project submitted to this Congress for its approval. I don't believe a wall, and, and again, one of the problems with this whole discussion is, what does the president mean when he says wall? Is it 30 feet high? Is it 20 feet high? Is it steel? Is it concrete? This has evolved over time. But the biggest question is where and how long? Is he talking about a wall that extends from the Gulf of Mexico to Southern California to the Pacific Ocean? That's about 2,000 miles. Is that what he's talking about? If so, we should know that. And then we can debate it as, as it relates to other potential options for securing the border along that distance. Now, it also should be noted that there already is wall, by anybody's definition, along portions of that border. I've seen them. I've been to McAllen, Texas, where the president was yesterday, and I've seen the wall, a wall. But the question is, how big is it, where is it going to go, and how is it going to be designed and paid for? Now, one of the reasons the wall is really not the right solution for the current problems of immigration starts with the fact that about 50% of the illegal immigrants, of the undocumented immigrants in this country today, are here on legal visas that they've overstayed. So a wall has nothing to do with these people. These are people that came in at airports and, and all other ports of entry into the United States all over the country. 50% came are here on overstaying visas. The wall has zero effect on that issue. The other principal issue that we're facing at the wall, and, and this has also been confused in the, the coverage and the caravans and the news and the fear that has been spread, the, the, the vast majority of the people coming to the, to the border today are not looking to sneak across. They're looking for a port of entry to give themselves up as asylum seekers. They are not illegal immigrants. They are availing themselves of American law that once they get to this country with a credible fear of prosecution or persecution or danger in their home country, they have a right to be determined whether they are legitimate asylum seekers, and that's who we're dealing with. That's who all those people are who you see the pictures, the caravan. They weren't headed for a, a blank place in the Arizona desert. They want to go. They want to be captured. They want to be taken into custody, and then they can have their asylum claim adjudicated. So the wall has nothing to do with them. And the wall is a response to a problem that's decades old that has grossly, dr drastically diminished over the last 10 or 15 years. The problem of people literally sneaking across the border, entering the country illegally. All of the data is that that number is down. It's down about 85% from the number of people that entered the country illegally in 2007 over the past 10 or 11 years. And by the way, all the data can be found in a fascinating document produced in September of 2017, about a year ago, by the Trump Administration Department of Homeland Security. And I can't remember the exact title, but it's something like Status of Illegal Immigration at the Southern Border. 
It's a long report full of graphs. And I like graphs, but I don't need to hold them up because all of the graphs have a, a downward slope in terms of illegal entries, people that get away, the number of people that are coming in that are recidivists who've been here before, they're all down. So to argue that somehow we're in a crisis today when all the indicators are moving in the right direction is really hard to reconcile with the reality. So the, 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 the issue that I'm trying to illustrate is the wall is the wrong solution to the current problem. It may have been a rational solution in 1985 or even in 2005 or in 2006 when the Congress passed a major fence law and did increase border security substantially. But today, we're dealing with a different set of problems that the wall, a wall, whatever it is, doesn't address. So I said at the beginning, nobody here is against border, secu border security. And there may be places where a wall is part of that. But one of the secondary problems that we have is we've never been told what this thing, the wall, is how long it will be, how big it will be, how much it will cost, whether it's going to be on private land or federal land. We don't have the plans, a plan, for what it is that's actually being proposed that the government is being held hostage over. We don't know what the president wants. To say, I want a wall, doesn't tell you much. Is it 2,000 miles long or 100 miles long? Is it 20 feet high? Is it a fence? Or is it a 30-foot high concrete wall? Or something with steel slats, which seems to be the, uh, the, the design of the day. We don't really know what it is. If the mayor of Bangor, Maine, went to the city council and said, I'm going to build, I want to build a new school but I'm not going to tell you how many students are going to be in it. I'm not going to tell you where we're going to build it. And I'm not going to tell you what it's going to cost, but just give me a blank check to build that school. The city council of Bangor would laugh her honor out of the hall. It wouldn't, it wouldn't even think about doing something. No city in America would do something like that. And yet that's what we're being asked here today. We're being asked essentially for a blank check. Well, it's a check of $5.7 billion, but that should, that's a down payment. The real estimates for what they think the president wants is more in the 20 to $25 billion amount. And that gets me to my final point before I talk about the impact of this in Maine. Let's say we could settle this this week. We could negotiate with the White House, which is not easy to do because the, their position changes day to day. But let's say we could negotiate and say, OK, it's going to be 100 miles of wall. and. Here's what it, you know, it, this will be the size, this will be the design, this is the agreed upon cost. Let's say that we could, we could do that. If we do that in the context of the government being shut down, we're inviting this to happen again. Next year, we'll have more budgets. We've got a debt ceiling debate coming that's very important for the future of the country, for the economics of the country, for the soundness of our economy, and we've got budgets coming next September. If this works, if this shutdown that's been initiated by the president works as a tactic to get a portion of his wall, he'll do it next time. That's, that's, that's why the age-old principle is you don't negotiate with hostage takers. Why? Because if you do, the next time they'll do it again. And this will become a normal and routine tactic between this president and perhaps future presidents and the Congress that puts us in a position of being totally uh, uh, we have to choose between a government shutdown and the pet project of whatever, whoever that president is. That's a very dangerous path for us as a deliberative body and particularly as a co-equal branch of the United States government. So, what, I mean, I've talked in sort of global terms, but this is hurting Main Street America. And we've heard today and we've heard on the news and we hear all the time about the effects on the furloughed 
federal workers, which are very real. Today's the day they don't get their check. And here's the problem. You can shut down and stop people's checks from coming, but you can't stop their bills from coming. Their mortgage payment, their child care payment, their automobile insurance, their home insurance, their heating bill, their medication, their food, all of that has to be paid for, and we can say, well, you know, they'll make adjustments. Well, that's a pretty hard path to put people on. That's a heartless path. And these people are being used as pawns, as hostages, in a policy debate that has nothing to do with them. One of the easiest solutions, Mr. President, would be for us to pass the six bills that the House has passed, that we passed, that fund 90% of the government. Why should the Department of Agriculture be caught in the, the crossfire of a debate over a wall in Texas? Why should park rangers be caught in that? Why should Coast Guard people be caught in that? And this is having a real effect. And aside from those federal workers, of whom there are about 1,000 in Maine on furlough right now, there are all the contractors that serve these government agencies. And we passed a bill uh, last night that's going to ensure that the, federal, the furloughed federal employees will eventually be paid. That doesn't say anything about what they're going to have to do about penalties on late mortgages and those kinds of things that they can't pay now. But there's no help for the contractors that are, are going to lose total income during this period, and some of them will be threatened of going out of business. So it's not just the 800,000 workers state, nationwide. It's thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of people who depend on those agencies uh, for uh, the work that they do, that they provide uh, to the federal government. But let's talk about effects in hometown, in Main Street, America. In the, in the uh, in, in just places all over Maine, in, in Portland, for example, one of the, this, the, I, I, I chuckle because it, it, it sounds like, oh, this is no big deal. One of our most growing industries in Maine is beer. And uh, we now have over 1,000 people employed in the craft brewing industry. It's been a growth industry. And yet, they're being stymied, the brewers are being stymied, many of them, because they can't ship their uh, beer across state lines without approval from the Food and Drug Administration of their labels, and that's held up. And we've got a merger or a, an expansion of a brewery in southern Maine that's held up because they can't get their permission from the uh, uh, Tax and Trade Bureau, from the uh, ATF. So the, these are the kinds of things, the services that are being provided that aren't being occurred. The Portland Press-Herald reported on the, on the breweries. The Portland Press-Herald also reported on a, on a developer that has a project to develop a, a, a real estate project in Maine, can't get an SBA loan, SBA shut down, and that's going to hold it up and could even cause the deal uh, to fall through. Uh, the Bangor Daily News reports a... Uh, a family that's stuck in the middle where they've moved out of their house anticipating a closing on a new house with an agriculture department uh, loan guarantee that's now st stuck, stranded, no, no action, nobody to answer the phone, and they're living out of boxes. They're caught in the middle. These are people, these aren't federal employees, these are main, good main people who relied upon the daily activities of the federal government occurring, which ought to be just simple common sense, and yet they're caught without a place to live. The Ellsworth American, a newspaper in Ellsworth, Maine, a, a weekly, a award-winning weekly newspaper, reports about a, uh, uh, a smokehouse that does smoked salmon. And, and they were getting ready to reopen, hire people. They've got people on staff. And all of a sudden, they're dead stop because of the Food and Drug Administration uh, can't, uh, 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 can't act to approve uh, their licenses. Now, you can say, okay, this little smokehouse can survive. The family will find a place to live. They can live. 
But if you multiply these examples by thousands and millions, you're talking about a really substantial effect on real people's lives. And there's no excuse for it. If this were over some major uh, uh, life or death policy issue, it would be somewhat understandable, but this is an eminently negotiable problem. Not a crisis, but a problem. I don't, I don't argue that it's not a problem and that the southern border doesn't need to be secure. Again, I swear, that's where I started. But the question is, how do you do it right? How do you do it in a way that makes sense to the American taxpayer? There may be places where it's wall, but the wall is $20 million a mile. There may be ways to do it for a fraction of that and provide equal security. There also are ways, for example, with better screening devices at the ports of entry to deal with drugs. And by the way, all of the data from the DEA, the, the current administration Depart uh, 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 drug enforcement agency, is that the principal source of drugs coming across the southern border is at ports of entry, hidden in cars, hidden in trucks, not over, through, and around someplace in the middle of the desert. That's where the drugs are coming through. That's where we ought to be concentrating. That's where we ought to be putting the technology, more dogs or more, more uh, technology that can de detect this kind of thing. Not building a wall that doesn't address the current problem. It just, it's, 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 the, it's a solution, but it's, it's going after the wrong problem. So, these are real life impacts. We don't, it doesn't need to be this way. If this were a project being proposed by the military, a new uh, BOQ at Fort Benning, it would come to this Congress. It would go to the authorization committee the plans would go to the Appropriations Committee. We would review it, question the sponsors, determine if it was an appropriate expenditure of public funds, and either approve it or deny it or suggest some alteration. This wall has not, never gone through that process. And we are basically abdicating to the administration a major decision, particularly about public expenditure, without meeting our responsibilities. Now, one really simple way to get out of this would be for us to vote by two-thirds to pass the budget that we voted like 98 to 2 several weeks ago, has $1.6 billion in it for border security, by the way, pass that, and then sit down and talk to the administration about just what it is that you want and what's reasonable and how do we do it in a sensible way, and then we can get this thing done. What worries me is the posture that the Senate is in today is adding a provision that isn't in the Constitution. The Constitution says the, the president can veto a bill. What we're saying here now through the, our uh, inability or unwillingness to bring a bill to the floor is the president can stop a bill simply by saying he doesn't like it. That's not what the Constitution says. It doesn't say the president has the right to stop bills he doesn't like. It says he has to veto it. If he's going to veto it, fine. Then we can discuss it and debate it and determine whether that's an appropriate veto. But by, by avoiding the responsibility of, of considering this legislation, we're essentially handing the president a massive power that presidents, I don't believe, should have. This is an important issue. It's one that should be considered. It's one that should be debated. I'd like to see the, the, the administration given the opportunity to pr make its case for the specifics, not the case generally about criminals or drugs, which many of, many of those claims have been uh, refuted, but a specific case about here's what we want to do, here's the, the effect of it, here's what it'll cost, and here's why this is the best solution as opposed to other solutions like a fence or more Border Patrol agents or more technology, a drone or sensors or, or whatever. But we're not being given that opportunity. I'm perfectly willing to debate that in good faith. I don't dismiss out of hand that wall, a wall may make sense in certain areas, but I'm not prepared to give this administration a blank check for some construction project that I, I don't know 
what it is they want to build. I'm also very reluctant to concede anything in the context of a hostage situation where the United States government is being held hostage because of a project that the president wants to build. If we do this, Mr. President, this will become the go-to tactic, tactic for this administration and probably for future administrations. We will have established a precedent that will haunt this institution for years to come. And that's one of the reasons I think it's just imperative that we not cave into this uh, kind of uh, uh, attempted in intimidation and express our good faith willingness to look at, work on, and try to establish the right role for all parts of border security, but not put all of our chips in one area that I believe will be both ineffective, not cost effective, and damaging to our other efforts to actually secure the border and protect the American people. Mr. President, I yield the floor.